Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study for a new week of morning studies. And we just invite you to join me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful once again to be able to meet together uh, to open your word and to look at Daniel chapter 11. And we know, Lord, we live in a difficult time. There's many winds of doctrine blowing around, many interpretations of prophecy. But we know, Lord, that you have led us and are guiding us in understanding your word and that um, uh, we are to examine your word in the light of, of the past using Miller's rules and that we need to be corrected, that the message of the Laodiceans applies to us today and that we need to heed that message and so we invite your spirit to teach and guide each one of us. We ask for your angels' care and protection in our lives and that you can lead us into all truth. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, good morning again, everyone. So a um, few things we need to look at today. And... Um, we had um, come to, I think, a clearer view of understanding Daniel chapter 11, um, especially when we look at um, verse 6, which we looked at, but really verse 6 to 9, uh, dealing with um, our time, so making an application to our time. And there's some questions that have arisen. So the first one I want to look at is um, the comment on Thursday's video. Um, so the comment there is, um, uh, here, I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen and we'll have to discuss this a little bit. So this is one of the points that we were discussing. Uh, so, So this is from Armageddon 66. I'm not sure why he spells Armageddon that way, but um, so he says, I do not agree, agree with ye about Daniel 11, verse 5. The best presentation is of Chowatau and Kimberly about all these things. So obviously he means uh, Chowatu and um, so I asked the question, hmm, which means I'm thinking, are you saying that his prince refers to the king of the South's princes um, rather than Alexander, Alexander's princes and the king of the South? So the way that we understood it, the king of the South, Ptolemy, shall be strong. And one of his, Alexander's princes, which is Seleucid, and he, Seleucid, shall be strong above him, Ptolemy and have dominion, his dominion shall be a great dominion. Um, so I'm not sure if I got, if, if that's how we understood it. Is that how we understood verse 5? Um, because the idea is that Seleucid is going to be stronger than Ptolemy. And that Seleucid is one of Alexander's princes. Right? I agree yeah. with you that the Seleucid is one of Alexander's princes. Yeah. <clears throat> but in the in the way that, that this verse seems to be written, mm -hmm. the king of the of the south shall be strong. <clears throat> That's a statement. Yeah. Is this saying that the king of the south shall be one of Alexander's princes? No. Okay. But then it says, and he shall be strong above him. Right. That's one of Alexander's princes, which is Seleucid. He shall be strong above him, which would be Ptolemy. Okay. So the problem in Hebrew is is the personal pronouns. Who is it referring to, right? Because it's not like English. And so, you know, you had directed us back to 
um, verse three, right? So we're going to have Alexander, his kingdom is going to be divided, right? And so when it says the king of the South Ptolemy shall be strong, and one of his princes, that is Seleucid, he shall be strong above him. The him there would refer to the one Ptolemy, but the his princes would refer to Alexander, right? So, so we have all these he's, him's, and his's. Uh, so the question is, well, which one belongs to who? So it, it isn't as clear cut as it would be in English. But based on the history, Seleucid, even though he has an alliance with Ptolemy, uh, he's not one of Ptolemy's princes. He's not a general of Ptolemy. It's not like, like they are separate generals of Alexander. And so I know Uri Smith and some others try to say, well, because he was allied with him, he's one of his princes. But the simple thing is just to see that in Hebrew, uh, that the his, one of his princes, doesn't have to refer to Ptolemy. It can refer to Alexander, which makes the most sense historically. And now the king of the south is strong. Seleucid, he ends up when he takes over the northern kingdom, he becomes the king of the north. He's definitely stronger than Ptolemy. Right. And he has the biggest dominion. Right. So he, he basically takes over. Uh, all of the other territories, north, east, and west. So Ptolemy just gets the south. Okay, so so anyway, that... So Seleucus is not the king of the south? No, Seleucus is the king of the north. That's the Seleucid Empire, the northern empire. The Ptolemic Empire is in the south, right? They're, they're named after Seleucid and Ptolemy. Okay. So so then I ask, how, can you tell me how Chao II understood these verses? Because... I don't personally, I never saw or heard of any of Chao Tu's presentations on Daniel 11, right? So it just says, or it is that his application to our time is what you're referring to. We've come to understand that the king of the north represents uh, the republicanism of the U.S., right? And the king of the south, the globalism embodied in the U.N. Would Chao Tu have made some kind of application to the U.S.A. and Russia? I'm guessing since I do not remember seeing his presentations on Daniel 11. So I'm not sure particularly how Chao Tu understood this. So he's going to say, well, Chao Tu and Kimberly specify that one of his princes, Ptolemy, uh, refers to Seleucus in verse 5 as um, uh, in verse 5, it was just print. I'm not sure what that means. Um so they're saying that uh, that his princes, that's Ptolemy's princes, right? Which is what Uri Smith says, um, who was helped to reach the northern throne until verse six when he was king. So it's obviously the, the alliance between Seleucus and Ptolemy allowed Seleucus to take the northern throne, right? Which is what happened historically. Uh, but that wouldn't make Seleucus one of Ptolemy's princes. But uh, to me, that's not really the important point of here. Then he says, um, uh, Chao Tu and Kimberly have applied the symbols of Daniel 11 in reference to Egypt, France, and USSR. So that is, they're taking, I believe he's meaning the king of the south. But somewhere a rift was created in the transfer of the king of the south from USSR to the UN today. Now, I believe he's using a translation program to, to translate from, I'm not sure if it's Romanian, I'm not sure what language he's translating from. Um, but, uh, so I'm not sure what he means by rift, but I, I think that wouldn't be a good translation. But, so we see that the king of the south moves from Egypt to France to USSR and then to the UN, which we would agree. But he says, I still haven't seen three characteristics, revolution, civil war, moving the capital and an official atheist law under globalism. Haven't we seen that? Okay, do we have a revolution, civil war that moves 
uh, the characteristics of the King of the South from the USSR to the UN? And do we see these characteristics? I believe we've been addressing these characteristics. Okay. So was there a revolution in the USSR, the Civil War? That led to the fall of the Soviet Union. There was definitely a change of the guard there, yes. Okay. Now, now the capital is obviously moved because it's in the UN. So, so the capital, where's the UN located? New York. It's in New York. So, so the characteristics of globalism, even though the USSR had those characteristics, they do move from this revolution civil war to the United States. Now, do we have an official atheist law? I mean, to describe what an official a atheist law is, I don't know if it, uh, would what the UN has done uh, have have any parallel to an official atheist law? I mean, I'm not sure exactly what uh, you know what that means. It maybe he means something different, but I would say uh, that we definitely have seen that occur. And if you want to look at it in the context of what has happened with the pandemic, we would have to say that we're under a new form of law ever since 2001, right? I think you could make that comment. Yeah, so, so I would say that from 1989 to 2001, <clears throat> this is what we see happening, that these three characteristics move to the United States. Now it continues to develop and grow, right? To the point on January 6, 2021, we're going to have, you know, the globalists defeat the Republicans. That is the King of the South has this war that defeats um, the North, right? Now he says, it is still not clear where we are in the external line of events before Raffia, between Raffi and Panin, where exactly? Now, when we talk about the external line of events, I mean, is January 6, 2021 an external line of events? Is it on an external line of events? I say so. Yeah. So in our internal line, Rafi and Paniam would apply to November 9th, 2019 and July 18, 2020. But on the external line, we 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 are in Rafia since January 6, 2021. I mean, Rafi at least is marked there. Now, as far as on a bigger line, a higher line above us, I, I mean, I agree, we don't know exactly what that means as far as a bigger line because we're not really sure how that bigger line and our line merge. But based on what we understand about the seven kings, uh, I would think we'd have to place Rafi at January 6, 2021, on some line. And Paneum would be the response uh, to that. Now, then he says, your application of globalism only in the U.S. A, is austere, considering that the pandemic had gold global implications. Well, I'm not really sure. It's austere. Well, it's, he's obviously, um, he just would say too severe, but he's translating from another language with a computer program. So it's obviously not a good translation, but it's just the idea that it's, it's too strict or restrictive. But I don't think that we just apply globalism only in the USA. What we're saying is that the US is defeated by the globalists. So the globalists, obviously, during the pandemic, they're they're in control, right? We would have to say that. So, so anyway, that's what he says. Now, um, so I, I talk about it. 
um, say I disagree with Uriah Smith, um, that part. So obviously we have, um, since Xerxes typifies Trump, Haman typifies the globalists in the story of Esther. And I do not fully understand Chow Tu's understanding of Daniel 11. And, and I see have seen the three characteristics. They seem obvious to me, right? So, so anyway, that's where where we are in that. Um, in, in any, any further discussion on that? So that's just reviewing a question that was brought up. Um, is there any anything about what he says that we need to consider further? I mean, I'm not just trying to brush it aside. Just trying to clarify what we understand here. And, uh, you know, unless we understand Chowtoo's and Kimberly's interpretation fully, I don't know if I can comment on it. Okay, Dwight, you had a comment? Well, <clears throat> I remember very little about Chowatu and Kimberly's overall discussion on this. I don't yeah, even. I don't, I don't think they ever made a presentation that I know of um, <laughs> in any of the meetings that I have seen of theirs. There was, I remember that there was a presentation, but I don't remember it being on Daniel. Yeah, so I know they did presentations on uh, Psalm 23. Right. Um, that was really what they were presenting because they were trying to present this view of the lines dealing with the prediction before midnight. And I also saw uh, a presentation they did in Alberta where um, they were dealing with the prediction before midnight in a very specific way. Um, and I had personal conversations where he, he was claiming he was Samuel Snow. Um, but, you know, if he did these presentations, they would not have been in, in North America. They weren't things that were recorded that I've seen. So, but I'm sure that he probably did make some originally. Um, but I know that he presented on December 17th, uh, 2000 and, uh, I guess that would be 2016. He presented to Jeff in Wales, I believe. And and then Jeff presented Raffia, and then also Paneum, which Chowatu hadn't uh, presented. So, um, so I don't know. I don't know what their their official view is. Stephen might know. I mean, what they actually thought. He might know of their presentations on it. Um, but yeah. It, it, <sighs> I mean, here we see that it passes to the UN. I mean, that seems pretty clear that it's not the USSR that is the king of the South, which Parminder and Tess were arguing and that Jeff had had that view, right? So in November 9th, you know, there's supposed to be this battle between the king of the North and the king of the South. Now, Jeff backed down on that and said that this prediction would fail prior to November 9th. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know bringing Chowatu and Kimberly's views, and I don't even know if it's Kimberly's views. I mean, I know that they presented as a team when it came to Psalm 23. I don't, maybe they always did uh, in all their presentations, but um, yeah, I don't see how this this undermines anything that we've said or changes anything that we've said. So the main thing is when we get to the the end of years, that is going to be September 11th, right? That's going to be when they have this agreement. That would seem to be, yes. Yeah. And um, so, and then when we get to out of a branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, we're applying that to Biden. So this has to do with the, the Democrats in defeating the Republicans and Trump specifically, placing Biden 
on the throne. It's a branch of her roots of this globalism that arises in our time. And then, you know, the, this carrying the captives, this has to do with uh, basically the religion of the United States that's that's taken captive. So the king of the South shall come into his kingdom, shall return into his own land. Um, we're just saying that that is, uh, even though it's a symbol of November 9th, um, you know, we're not saying that that ends in November 9th, 2019. It's just, it ties these verses from 6 to 11, all about basically what's the result of September 11th. It brings us into our history. But but we could say, you know, this is all about September 11th. But But the thing is, out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. We saw that our line brought this to January 20th, uh, 2021, right? So it's in that history from November 9th to December 25th, 2021, that we have this, that we have Biden rise up. So to me, I, I'm very satisfied with the application to our time. You know, maybe it's just because I did it you know, like with your co-op, with your participation, but it, to me, it makes sense. And I don't see how to, you know, how to challenge it, that it's it's a faulty application based upon all of the information that we had, right? So we have all these symbols. Um, they all seem to fit together. Um, so I don't know. Placing Biden as the sixth. So this is where we want to get to the next thing. Um, so the next thing we need to look at just to review this has to do with Jeff's number 10 of Elijah. So we're going to look at that. And I'll share the screen here. Okay, so uh, I mean, William and I discussed this uh, prior to the study. Okay. Uh, let me see. I kind of lost this here. Okay. Now, in this, uh, Jeff is arguing this idea that that the Philadelphian Church has to replace the Laodicean Church. Now, we discussed this before. Um, this is, and I'm just going to call it a heresy, because I've recognized it as a heresy. Uh, that is very common. Um, this heresy is usually connected with other ideas. Um, but here, he, Jeff is introducing this idea that the Millerite movement began prophetically as the Philadelphian church. Now, that's not quite true, right? Because the Millerite movement begins when? It begins about 1833. Yeah, so we're going to begin it with Miller. And in that time, he's still the Church of Sardis, right? Philadelphia applies to which period specifically? I would think 1840 to 1844. Yeah, so 1840 to 1844. So we'd say August 11th, 1840, you know, at least that if we wanted to specify a specific date, um, to October 22, 1844. So that's going to be the Philadelphian church. Now, now we know it's going to be in 1856 that we have the Laodicean church, you know, officially recognized by James and Ellen White, that the Adventist church had become the Laodicean church. But we they actually did apply it earlier uh, to the Millerite movement. Correct? That is, they labeled the Millerites after October 22nd, 1844, who had rejected the midnight cry as Laodiceans. Correct? Any, anybody not familiar with that? So you're all familiar with that idea, that that's how they first labeled the, the Laodicean church as being that group? 
Okay, so you're all agreed there. So, so, but when when they actually applied it to the Seventh Day Adventists, not just the First Day Adventists, that's not until 1856 that they recognized that the Seventh Day Adventists had also become Laodicean. So we can see that they marked the end of the Philadelphia Church as October 22, 1844. So that Philadelphian Church doesn't continue until 1856. It's just that the First Day Adventists are the ones who are Laodicean, right? Now, the message, of course, does apply to the Adventists as well, even in that period, because it is a message to the church. That is, it's not, it's not, it's not so much that you could become a Philadelphian or become a Laodicean. It's actually a specific message to a specific spirit, period of time, a message that is needed for that period of time. And that message is still valid today for Seventh-day Adventists, of which we are Seventh-day Adventists. And so we need to heed the message of the true counsel to the Laodiceans. Right? Ellen White does not place the Philadelphian message in any of her writings as occurring after the Laodicean message or as a church that we have to become prior to Christ's coming, right? I know of no statement to that in that regard. You won't find it in the spirit of prophecy, which is why I've always recognized this idea as heretical. That is, it's not founded in a plain statement of scripture or in the spirit of prophecy that we have to become Philadelphians. I don't know if anybody have any comment on that. The only thing in this in this situation is that the Philadelphians seem to be in a type of unity. Right. The the comments that she has made in the past have been that at the end that those that are giving the message were unified and going forth basically as an army. Right. But it doesn't make us the Philadelphian church. I'm, I'm not disagreeing yeah. with your point. The problem that I'm having with that is when have we seen anything within scripture that goes backwards with the exception of, of the prayer of one king asking for the, the sun to go back. Yeah. Yeah, we don't go backwards. There's a progression of these churches. And those that heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, they receive the, that message. They will be the 144,000. You don't, the Philadelphians don't become the 144,000 historically, right? They have a certain experience in which they receive no um, rebuke, right? So, and that, that testifies to the purity of that message during that period from 1840 to 1844. But yeah, you, you don't go backwards. So just because the Laodiceans, some of them heed the message, doesn't mean they cease to be the last church. Now, so then something happens here. Um, okay, so I don't think I agree with Angela's statement. She says, spiritually, Philadelphia is what we should be aspiring to. Brotherly love under Christ. This would occur when we have Acts 1, Pentecost experience. Because I think that's mixing up something. So the Church of Philadelphia is a specific message to a specific period of time. You can't aspire to be Philadelphia. You can aspire to be have brotherly kindness, to be united, but that can't make you Philadelphia. You, you just can't aspire to be a prophetic period of time in which you don't live, right? But I understand the idea. The idea is that that was a good condition that the church was in during that period of time. But we're not living in that period of time. 
and we can't we can't aspire to live in that period of time because we don't have time travel right so so I, these to me were the things that people get confused that that have always bothered me about and maybe it's just because I have you know a personal feeling about this Philadelphia church idea because of my experience with people who've believed it in the past. Um, and I don't know, Dwight, have you ever run into this in the past? Not really. Yeah. Now, Iran does note that Jeff refers to this idea of the Philadelphian and the Laodicean. So I know it's, it's something that Jeff has talked about before. Um, now, now this is the 2004 prophecy school that that uh, Jeff was referring to the Philadelphia Laodicean churches, and I know this is something Dwayne Dewey talked about a lot. I believe it was Dwayne Dewey. Um. So, but yeah, it's see, I associate this with other kinds of errors. Um, usually, an attack upon uh, the SDA church. Right. So the SDA church is Laodicean, but I'm a Philadelphian. And that you have to come out of the Seventh-day Adventist church, because if you're in the church, then you're a Laodicean. But you need to come out and join, you know, come out of Babylon and become a Philadelphian. That's normally how I've seen it. But anyway, this is not really the main problem with this. Yeah, I understand what Angela is referring to an attitude and I would agree with that. So obviously we need to have that attitude, but we can't be, we don't then become the lay uh, the Philadelphian church. There isn't a movement that we can label Philadelphian after Laodicean. That's, that's my main point. So, so maybe I just have some, you know, baggage from the past regarding this, but I don't think that's even the main problem. So, what he says here is the last movement would die, then stand and thereafter be resurrected as the enzyme. So what he's saying is the last movement is the Laodicean. It has to die. And then the Philadelphian is going to be resurrected. Now, the Philadelphian is the sixth church. So we have to keep this in mind because this is in the context of the seven kings, the seven churches. And. Um, an application that he's making also to the presidents of the United States. So the last movement would die, then stand and thereafter be resurrected as an enzyme. So he's going to use this from Revelation 11, where it talks about um, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Now, there's some things here about this. So the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, um, this is during the French Revolution, as we know. So this is an atheistic power. Um, and this is the Old and New Testament. Their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. This is France, right? So he's now going to apply this to um, to the um, these uh, churches, right? Now he says the Republican horn forms forms an image to the beast, and the beast that it forms the image to, of is addressed in Revelation 17. And that beast is identified as the fifth head that received a deadly wound, right? So we have the fifth head receiving a deadly wound. That would be resurrected as the eighth head. It would be resurrected as the eighth that was of the seven. Now, of course, we see that, that that's actually not what the verse is saying, that the seventh king is actually the papacy, not the eighth. Right? As far as, um, or pardon me, yeah, the eighth is the papacy, but it's not one of the heads, right? It's not, um, how do we do this? Um, I'm getting mixed up. So when we looked at the kings, right, the kings are presidents of the United States, not these kingdoms. And the papacy is the eighth. And it's placed there or comes from the seven. It comes from the seven. So the seven is the United States, which is going to form an image to the beast. 
But the eighth is the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Even he is the eighth, right? So about the eighth here, is the eighth one of the presidents of the United States? And, and, and so this becomes really confusing. Because he says it's going to be resurrected as the eighth head. But as we go on and read, the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth. He is of the seven and goeth unto perdition. The Republican horn would form an image of that beast. It therefore would be killed and then resurrected. So the Republican horn, that is one of the horns in the sixth head, right, of the beast of Revelation 13. When it was resurrected, it would be the eighth head that was of the seven previous heads. Right. So he's saying that the image made to the beast is going to be the eighth of these seven previous heads. The Protestant horde rides upon the eighth beast as the Republican horn. And would need to possess the same prophetic dynamics. The transition from Philadelphia to Laodicea in the Millerite movement prefigures the transition from Laodicea to Philadelphia in the last movement. When the last movement received a deadly wound on July 18, 2020, it dies as Laodicea. When, as represented in Revelation 11, it transitioned to Philadelphia, it would represent the eighth church that is of the seven. The death in the year 2020 was paralleled by the Republican horn, for since the time of the end in 1989, there had been six presidents. The sixth president received a deadly wound that will be healed in 2024. That head will then be the eighth head of the United States since the time of the end in 1989, and it will be of the seven. Both horns were the sixth that becomes the eighth. This truth is a large part of the message of revelation of Jesus Christ that is unsealed before the close of probation. Now, can somebody make sense out of any of this for me? Okay, now which which one of Jeff's presentations are we reading from here? This is number uh, number 10 of Elijah. Okay. Now, to me, it, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. There's just no clarity here. Because he's going to mix up the churches, the kings, and the kingdoms. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> And yet, there's no consistency in how they do that. So you're going to have the sixth Republican president being Trump who receives the deadly wound, right? But, but it's the fifth that receives the deadly wound in the other ones. And also, the, it wouldn't be the sixth. It'd be the fifth. Okay, go on. That, that, was, that was the point that I was going to make, because as we, as we examined this carefully, mm -hmm. about, what, eight days ago? Yeah. There is no way that trump can be the sixth i mean yeah. uh, if they if they wish to misapply the verse then yes they it can be but in a in a in a strict application <clears throat> if darius is if darius the mead is the equivalent of reagan mm -hmm. because he was Median, he was not Persian. Right. And then you have the four kings with the fifth being richer than they all, right? Yeah. So how else are we to approach this? I mean... Okay. Can I can I ask a question? Please, okay. On the Cyrus. On the Cyrus. Didn't he make the first decree? Yeah. Did um George Bush Senior make a decree under the first under his first reign? 
Not that I know of. Well, he did. He said we need a new world order. Didn't he? That would be correct. Yeah, if you're going to call that a decree, I guess. I mean, well, that's that. I'm see. I that's if he if if we're going to put these presidents with the like Cyrus, I mean, they have to have the same. I would I would say the same attributes as the rest of them, right? He would just have to have the same attitude, I reckon, wouldn't he? But, well, so the thing that we know is that um, we we already paired uh, Darius the Mede with Reagan because they're both not kings at the time of the end. Now, Reagan technically is is president until uh, George Bush the first becomes president on January twentieth, nineteen eighty nine. But the time of the end is November 9th, nineteen eighty nine. Reagan isn't president any longer. But he's still connected with that time of the end, just as Darius is. The time of the end is 537 in um, in Cyrus's history, because it's the end of the 70 years since the Hebrew first Hebrew captives were carried away. So it's technically going to be the fall of uh, 537 BC. Now, now Darius is in some ways, the king. He's the king of Persia, or the king of Media, pardon me. But Darius, or, or um, Cyrus, in conquering Babylon, he's the general, and he's the one who's noted there, right? But it's going to be in, in 537, um, you're going to have uh, Darius the Mede die. And then when the first decree is given, it's given in 536 in the spring, you know, April 24th. And um, so that's going to be under Cyrus. So, you know, Cyrus is the first king of Persia. And if you're going to parallel them, as we have, you, you can't start with Reagan as the first. So the five that are fallen in the kings, you know, are Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama and Trump. The sixth is Biden. So. What, so, what yeah, I was thinking, what I was thinking is, yeah, what I was thinking is that you could take, and every one of the decrees that was made, you could put a president of the United States under that decree, right? That so that the Medes of Persia was made. Okay. Well, Darius, we line up with Obama. Right. Right, and and Trump, we line up with. Uh, um. Xerxes. Uh, but we don't get a decree until the seventh, Artaxerxes. So I, I don't know what decree you would put with Obama, but we could definitely see him in the seventh. It's going to be the Sunday law. Okay. Now, yeah. Yeah. Um, I need to correct or at least expand a little bit on what I'd said earlier because having Trump in this line. I said Trump being as the fifth king, and that would be an inclusive count, because the way that the verse reads is, but now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand, yet stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. That's Trump, yeah. yeah. And I don't, it's not an inclusive count, unless you, you're using the word in a different meaning. It's just that we start with Cyrus, Okay. Then there's going to be three, and then there's going to be a fourth. But that fourth is the fifth Persian king. Okay. Now, using one of the rare things that Mrs. White had to say in this in this portion, and this is from Prophets and Kings 556 and 557. We are able to establish that, as we see in verse 1, that Daniel's prayer had been offered in the first year of Darius, the Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. Yeah. Now, Darius, being typified by Reagan, 
or Reagan being typified by Darius. Okay, thank you. Yes. Had stood up and given several speeches, one of which very famously was Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Right. Yeah, so we can see it's under under Reagan that we're going to have that the beginnings of all the things that are going to transpire in 1989 are because of Reagan. Right. Right. Now, that's why we line them up with their eyes. Okay. Now, we recognize that upon his death, about two years after the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne, and the beginning of his reign marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. Now, under George H.W. Bush, we also have the speech that Brother William was referring to about the New World Order. Yeah. So, all of this can be lined up with what we have been seeing occurring with some of these different presidents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so we can also look at the fact that um, the vice president of Reagan, I just looked it up, you can see, watch me look it up, was right. uh, George Bush. H.W., yeah. The senior. Right. So he was the vice president. And so once Reagan, you know, his term was up, his two terms, um, then they had an election. And uh, I can't remember who he run against, but, you know, he ends up being the next president. So there is that parallel there with uh, Darius the Mede and Cyrus. But if we're going to do the count of the seven the seven kings of Persia, and we're going to parallel it with the seven presidents, it makes Biden the sixth. But even then, the problem is the inconsistency within this argument. So we have, of course, we know that the 10 kings refers to the presidents of the United, or the seven kings refers to the presidents of the United States. The eighth is not one of the kings because it's the beast that thou sawest that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Right. So the eighth is not one of the presidents. Right. It's not one of the kings. Which is is what Colin has been arguing. But even here, when they're using this, they're misapplying. They're, They're taking the churches. The presidents and the kingdoms and lying, lining them up inconsistently. Because we know it's the fifth kingdom that receives the deadly wound. But he's saying it's the sixth church and the sixth president that received the deadly wound. Right. So that that doesn't make sense. It needs to be the fifth that receives the deadly wound. And definitely to try to make an application of these to the churches. Um. We have no support for the idea that there is a resurrection of one of the churches in the way that that this is trying to be done. And if it would be, it wouldn't be the sixth. If you're going to parallel them, it would have to be the fifth church, you know, Sardis, in which there would be a resurrection. It, It just, to me, this is just sloppiness. It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, and again, you know, we know that this is purportedly Jeff is writing this. And then there's some stories going around that Jeff, you know, was riding his tractor and heard a voice telling him, why are you, why are you riding a tractor? And then he started writing these articles. Oh, we don't, I don't know where they get the story from, how the story has been passed down to get to whoever said the story. Um, but even then that wouldn't, that wouldn't be following Miller rule, Miller's rules to understand what is truth. 
if we're going to accept a story that somebody is telling that then we have to accept what Jeff is saying about this, um, that would go against everything that we believe. The way I heard it was that uh, Jeff was plowing or doing something with his land and he heard God's voice saying, what are, what do is thou here? And then he started to write and he was supposed right. to be talking to Colin and relating the story. Talking to who? He 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 was supposed to have have a talk to Colin, and then he he told Colin the story. So it's possible, oh, but of oh, course, people are going to build some kind of an idol to this. Well, well, I don't like think this. Colin's talked to Jeff. He he says. Well, he that's hasn't. what I've been told. I can't verify anything. I'm just hearing all kinds of things. Right. So this is what I'm saying: is that it's hearsay. Um. But also, even if it were true that Jeff heard a voice telling him, what are you doing here? I mean, it doesn't mean that what he's going to write after that is going to be correct. Right? It just it just doesn't follow. I mean, Agreed. you know, um, the, the thing is, does it agree with God's word? And so what we see here is not from my view, this doesn't appear to be uh, Jeff's logic. It it doesn't it doesn't even seem to be his language, but but it's not the logic he would use. So the idea that that the last movement receives a deadly wound on July 18, 2020, it, it just doesn't make any sense from any kind of line. Just to say, well, that was the Laodicean movement. And it receives a deadly wound on July 18, 2020. I mean, how does that have anything to do with Philadelphia? It transitioned to Philadelphia when it would Perhaps. represent. I center. haven't read this entire thing, but sorry. Okay. But I'm thinking, okay, maybe it parallels what happened after 10, 10, 1022, 1844. The ones who remain studying, beseeching the Lord to reveal his plan, what went wrong, what was wrong with the way that we thought that 1022, 1844 would transpire. Maybe he's saying that is Philadelphia in our day and the ones that fell away are Laodicea. I don't know. Like I haven't even read this 10th yeah. tenth, tenth article by Jeff, so I'll have to look at yeah, it. Yeah, well, I you know, I've skimmed through the articles. I've spent time like studying them, just you know, reading some of the main points that are being made, right? Um, but yeah, it doesn't. None of this really makes any sense to me. It to mix these different sevens all together in the way that he has in this article. And and then to just take January uh, 18th, 2020, and to just try to make it this receiving a deadly wound, it, there's not even a parallel. Like, there's nothing that we could really parallel that with other than he's just saying, well, that's the seventh church receiving a deadly wound. Well, if it received a deadly wound on July 18, 2020, so what he's trying to do is say, when this movement was Laodicean, it was in error the whole time. So the idea is that he, he would go back to 2012 because he doesn't say exactly when Laodicean starts in this movement, at least not that I've seen. But I know he has made applications of the seven churches in our time that you could start them at 1989 and, and apply those messages in a, in a parallel way in our history. So, so maybe he's taking saying, well, Laodicean is starting, I'm not sure where, but let's say we go from his other articles, it's starting in 2012. Um, so that the church is not having any new light. All that light that we had then we need to disregard. Well, isn't the whole idea of the presidents of the United States and the Persian kings of things that were developed in 2015, 2016, 2017? And if we were Laodicean then, how come we're bringing up some of the things from that history, but rejecting other things? 
again, this is the picking and choosing that that we went through with Tess and Par Parminder. Right. This is what's scary to me. Like when I go through Jeff's stuff, I'm gonna say, well, what is true? What is it? I just don't know because I don't have a great foundation in SDAism. And what is fantasy? Like, who is writing this? Like, that's why I said it could be ghost written. I mean, I see some of the, the errors, like, uh, when he, when he will confuse, uh, gone and went and stuff like that. That's Jeff, but the rest of it, I'm just scratching my brain and thinking, I don't, I'll listen to it, but I really don't understand what this okay. is all about. You know, uh, you know, um, Kelly suggested it could be AI writing it. Well, it's AI speaking it for sure. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, which, but it, it's just not logical. Like, it's just, there's no, there's no logic to it. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And, um, yeah, so this idea of picking and choosing, which I don't like. But also, there's no parallel in Millerite history. The only parallel we have is Miller, after October 22, going back and saying, well, that movement that happened from, you know, March 21st, 1844, you know, till October 22, that wasn't of God, right? We were wrong, you know, uh, I got carried away when I supported it. Um, and, and that we have a parallel. So, you know, as Colin says, it's it's tempting to see that parallel but he doesn't give a reason why that parallel isn't correct. It, and it's not a temptation. It's just the obvious parallel that to see Jeff presenting now, contrary to what he had taught before, um, saying that, well, what I taught before wasn't correct, you know, since 2012, but I'm going to pick a few things out of there that, that are correct but present them in a way that has no consistency, that that would be worrying. So, so anyway, it, it's just reviewing back over what we have studied, but seeing that, that this is much more logical and consistent to apply these things the way that we do. So now when we get to, um, you know, to putting these things on a line in our history, um, so we have these lines. I'm just going to show you here. Um, you know, so when we had done this, like we haven't written, you know, here's the time of the end. Here's the first angel's message uh, formalized. Here's the first angel's message arriving. But I think we could easily do that with this line. I could probably write it out in a bit cleaner way. But uh, we can see that there is a period of darkness that's well defined. That's going to be the 191 years. And that's going to be completed on February 15th, 1989. And then there's 276 days. Now, um, these 276 days, uh, we dealt with them uh, in in what way? How did we address the 276 days that lead to November 9th, 1989? Right. So we're saying that that's the period of darkness. Then you have this 276 days. And then you officially have the time of the end. So what does 276 represent? Well, that was the uh, the, the the amount of, of uh, passengers on the ship in Acts 27. Okay. So so we get Acts 27. Now as far as relating to the time of the end when does the American Revolutionary War end? 
with the Treaty of Paris? What year? Anybody know? Dwight, do you know? I believe it was more like 1789, but I'd have to look it up. 1783. Okay. So you're going to have uh, the American Revolution officially ended in 1783. Um, the 276th crime number is 1783. Interesting. Yeah. So that gives us that period of time there. That, that we have before the time of the end. So we mark November 9th, 1989 as the time of the end. Did you say it was the 276th prime? 270, 276th prime number. Now, that's that's the number of days we have there, 276. So if I look at the 276th prime, it's 1783. How many people were on the ship with Paul total? Well, 276. Yeah. yeah, so we, we relate it to that, and we can also, because Angela mentioned that. Okay, go on. No, I just I just asked that question. Yeah, so so we can relate it to that symbol in Acts uh, chapter uh, 27, right? Right. Okay, so it's it's tied to that symbol. But we also can tie it to that period of time from the end of the revolution to 1798, right? Okay. Right. So that means we can take this February 15th, 1989 to November 9th, 1989, and it's connecting that same sort of symbol. There it's going to be a period of 15 years, um, right, from 83 to 98. But... Uh, so I, I know it's, to some people that's a bit obscure, but to see that this 276 prime number is 1783 does tie it together in this way, because we've already made this parallel between the time of the end in 1798 with November 9th, 1989. But this period of time here, 276 days from the end of that uh, um, um proxy war in Afghanistan gives us that that symbol of that that period of time from the end of the revolution to um, 1798. So so it ties those all together is what I'm trying to say. And we can see it goes back to 1798 with the uh, February 15th, 1798. So you have the February 15th, 1989. And that February 15, 1798, right? And then you can take, the, you understand what I'm saying. Those two things agree with each other. There's three things. Okay, so we can mark that period as that, that history of what happened with the Afghan-Soviet War as connected to the time of the end, just as the American Revolution is tied to the time of the end. Okay, and then when we get to 1989, we're just going to mark that as the time of the end. And it's a period of time, 777 inclusive days. So in this line um, of these, of Daniel chapter 11, verses 3 to 9, um, would September 11th, 2001 be a formalization? in this case, in this line particular. That's a possibility. Okay. So if it's a formalization, it's a formalization of a message, right? And that message is relating to the, the dissolution of Alexander's kingdom. And this is going to be the agreement, right? So that's going to start on September 11th. We have this agreement that's made. In our history, we look at it with two different ways. We have the internal dealing with the Adventist church and accepting spiritual formation. And then with the United States, uh, the Patriot Act, 
right, which goes from common law to Roman law. So there's a formalization there. There's documents that we would connect with 2001. Now, an empowerment of that, um, how would that be empowered in that line? So we have, we have a number of different uh, way marks here. We have, you know, we kind of have nine way marks. So not, not all of them are, okay. So Angela says something here, just look at, look at that. She says the 206 years between 1783 and 1989, 206 bones in the human body, uh, February 6th, Theodore James Turner's birthday, 26 is a double of 13. Okay. I, I don't know if the number of bones in the human body is fixed. I mean, there's probably an average, but uh, I haven't counted my bones particularly, so I'm not sure. Um, Theodore, where does um, 1996 play in on this? Well, it doesn't. Because it's not part of this line. This line is not about this movement. This is a line about okay. the presidents of the United States. Right? This is line is about uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the globalists taking over the United States. Okay, right? I so just I just was thinking nineteen ninety six for some reason. No. Yeah. So so it wouldn't be part of that line, this line here. It's part of our line. And some of these waymarks are in our line. But this line is specifically addressing the fall of the Soviet Union. And that means that the, the characteristics of the king of the south, he shall do according to his own will, all of those characteristics, which are also papal characteristics, but that happened with Alexander's kingdom. Um, 1963 plus 26 is 1989. Okay. Um, those things are moving, that is, the globalists, the Soviet Union falls, but the Soviet Union, as this atheist globalistic power, its characteristics are going to pass to the UN, and the UN, the globalists, are going to conquer the United States. That's what this line is about. So we can see September 11th would be a formalization of it. The question is, where is that empowered? Now we have the next way marks are, we have a January 20th, 2011. Nothing happens on that date. But we do have Trump's election on November 9th, 2016. Now, now Trump's election, even though we would say, well, that's a victory against the globalists because he defeats Hillary Clinton. Can this be an empowerment of the first message in sort of a, um, a strategic way from not from man's perspective, but from Satan's perspective of what's ultimately going to be accomplished? Because if Trump is not elected, does the United States devolve into the chaos that we see today? I mean, we have at that different. point, I think so. Yeah, with HRC in power, uh, she is going to be even worse than Biden because she's she has her wits about her and she's extremely. Okay, well, yeah. So she would she would be a, have been a terrible president, and she would have gotten voted out at the end of four years, right? I mean, it's hard to say. What ifs are very difficult things to. You know, I always say hindsight's 50 50. Um, you know, because you, you can't really say what would have happened if uh, this this happened or that happened. You know, you, you only know what did happen. But um, the point is the extremism that resulted by Trump being elected, it really changed, it really was involved in polarizing America. Now, it's kind of hard to say what if, I mean, but the election was pretty close. And if the Democrats had just, you know, 
employed dead Republicans in voting in that year um, a little more vigorously. You know, they could have been in power. But there, they would be in power and there really wouldn't have been anyone to stop them. But their plans are not to just change everything suddenly. They have a lot of rhetoric. And, and over time, they would have changed things. But it wouldn't have been as drastic. So all of the things that happened by Trump being elected, it really sped things up, I believe, rather than slowing things down because it, it created much more polarization. But that's just my opinion, right? But, but we could say anyway that Trump being elected would fit as the empowerment of that message, right? I'm just going to borrow these uh, tags here. So, you know, we're going to, oh, I didn't get the first angel arrives, but okay. I'm just going to move these down here for now. Just so we can see them easier. Okay, so we're going to put the formalization here and put the empowerment here. I just need these. Okay, is that making sense so far? Because this is all about moving the power from the Soviet Union, the globalist, to the UN. And this uh, uh, agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union. Now, now, one of the things that you know that that I have, um, you know, I am a conspiracy theorist. This is a confession here. That is, I believe that there is a conspiracy going going on that's much different than what appears on the surface. That, that Satan is behind a conspiracy that the participants in the conspiracy aren't aware of. That is, Satan has his plans. As much as uh, Hillary Clinton wanted to become, you know, the president of the United States, I don't think that that was in Satan's plans. That that the war and because what they want to do, I mean, what really needs to happen for Satan's plans to work is a destabilization of society. Right? Without Trump becoming president, it's much more difficult to destabilize society. I mean, there's other ways to do it. Um, but creating polarization is what you want to have. You want the country. To be the oh, totally okay. agree. They had to have a flash. Yeah. So, so Clinton may, may not be aware of the fact that you know Satan didn't want her to be president; that he wanted Trump. But also, when you think about it, um, they could easily get rid of Trump, and and the way that you do it is ignore him, right? If the the media did more to promote Trump in 2000, his election in 2016, then, then like they, they, he could not have paid for the advertising that they gave him. And he knew how to do it. He would just say outrageous things that they could then make fun of. But all of those things got him elected, right? Okay, so, so we're going to put that as the empowerment. Now we have, you know, four more waymarks to place. Um, and, you know, we have the January 20th, 2018. So that's going to be just a date, right? It's not 
it's it's just a symbol in our lines marking these January 20th. These are almost like echoes, pre-echoes of, of the January 20th, 2021. But we could put that the second angel arrives here, November 9th, 2019. Now, now, particularly on November 9th, we're not we're not marking some specific event in in American history, so to speak. But we do have in connection with this history. We have the start of the pandemic. Right. So if this is a message that's arriving, that's. Uh, arriving in 2019, COVID-19, right? How would that be a second angel's message arriving? Because we have to think about what this is. So this is about the Soviet Union, which is the king of the south. It's dissolution. It's globalism. And it's going to move to this period in history in which uh, the pandemic is going to be put in place. Oh, I can see in Revelation 14, 8, it says she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, this so-called pandemic went worldwide yeah so definitely it's a globalist thing right you know by the very nature of a pandemic and um and that that the un had a huge role in declaring the pandemic and and the, all the actions that happened with it so just from a prophetic symbol whether whatever one thinks about the pandemic is is immaterial, just as a prophetic symbol, it would place the arrival of a second angel's message in that history. Now, the other option would be just to say, well, we would move the empowerment of the first angel, but because in some ways it's it it is kind of like an empowerment of the first angel. But remember, in our lines are the empowerment of the first angel and the or and the arrival of the second the same way mark we've seen this many times in the book of judges is november 9th 2016 connected to november 9th 2019 can we see that's like having two 911s i believe we established that okay so so i think we can see how these two things are connected. Now, of course, the president in 2019 is still going to be Trump. But Trump is Xerxes, and Xerxes is deceived by Haman, right? And that's going to happen in that history. So, so to me, this fits perfectly to put the second angel arriving as November 9th, 2019, with the empowerment as November 9th, 2016. Gives us symbols that we've seen before tied together. Now, uh, the formalization of this, that would be, um, you know, how would we characterize that? I don't think I would personally put July 18th as the formalization unless somebody could give me a good reason to do so. I'd have to think about that. Um, but I definitely could see uh, Biden coming into office as a formalization of this, right? Because under Biden, we're going to see the mandates and all, all the crazy lockdowns and everything that that under Trump uh, were, were just a, a deception. Here, they're going to be continually promoted Um in that history. So we're going to have, uh, and even prior to Biden's being inaugurated, of course, uh, um, we're going to see um, 
Well, anyway, we'll just leave it there. We'll just put his inauguration because I'm not sure about some of the things. Um, so we have this, this pandemic in this history. Now, now, when do the first vaccines get issued? That's going to be when? That's going to be like at the end of 2021? No. No, when? There, there were some that were coming out in between July 18th of 2020 and January 20th. Okay, in that period there was? Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm always trying to remember. I think you you could be correct. Um, yeah, my my landlord got his first jab in March of 2021. 20, so mm -hmm. they were up before that. Yeah, I mean, I had uh, COVID-19 in November of, of 2020. So, um, so I'm trying to see this here. Uh, just no, I think I think you guys are wrong here. the The first vaccine is approved um, August twenty third, twenty twenty one. I think you guys are moving this. No, I recall because oh. I had my stroke because of okay. betting. No, okay. I'm reading this wrong. It says since December 21 to December 11, 2020, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine has been available under EUA to individuals 16 years of age and older. So I'm just reading a, a press release from later about uh, updating vaccines. So it's December 11th. That's going to be the first one that's approved. Uh, I might find in something else here. Uh, let me see Wikipedia, what they say. Um, yeah, so they accelerated this. Um, so, okay, I'm just trying to find their timeline. That's what I want. Okay, that's going to give you too much. Um, okay. okay. Anyways, yeah, it's going to be in in the end of December, but that's going to be you know Trump is still technically president; he's lost the election, um, but it's in that history that we're gonna see that happening. So I'm just saying in this broadest sense, Biden coming into power uh, allows these things to be pushed in the way that they were. And so we're just gonna put January 20th, 2021. So it's it's in that history. So I'm saying that's a formalization um, of that second angel. So this is um, dealing with the pandemic. And then we're going to have an empowerment. Now, you know, so, I mean, we just have a couple of waymarks here. So I'm just going to put these here because those are the waymarks we have. And we have December 25th, 2023. Now, we don't have any event for December 25th, 2023. And, and, so probably, you know, some people might want to move the formalization over to July 18th, and the empowerment over to January 20th. That might make more sense to them uh, because that's where we're going to have the vaccines. But we don't know what December 25th, 2023 is. Um, and then we we have January 20th, 2025. That's going to be um, a third message arriving. And that's going to be, of course, uh, the inauguration of the next president. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not certain about the end of this part of it, but we can see that this still represents a line, however we wanted to do this. I mean, what somebody could do is just say, this is the formalization, right, in this period, and that, you know, this is the empowerment itself, and that, 
you know, this is going to be the arrival of the third message. You know, we could put it over here, you know, however we wanted to do it. But I don't have an answer for that yet. Like, I don't know. I don't have any certainty about how to place these. But, but we can say that these do represent a line that's logical and that this is leading to, and, you know, what we could put in here, uh, you know, we could have put maybe uh, January 6, 2020, 20, 2021, January 6, 2021. We don't have it in this line. We just kind of group January 20th, 2021 altogether. But this is when that, if, you know, whether we could have a different line where we specify some of these dates, we definitely can put it in that history anyway. So maybe that formalization is the time of, of the pandemic where uh, everything's kind of locked down. Now that's going to start like March 27th in, in March of 2020. So March, April, May, June, July. So that's four months later. March the 17th. I, I remember distinctly. Yeah. Uh, well, well, it's 391. For us, for us here, it was March 27th. For us here in Alberta, it was March 27th that we had. Yeah, BC was seven, March 17th. What well, is 391E? Uh, um, that just means inclusive. So from December oh, 20th, it could be I then. No, ex exclusive, pardon me. I, I could just put 391.5. Like that, if I counted from noon, December 25th, 2023, to the beginning of January 20th, 2025, it'd be 391.5 days. So, so I was just putting exclusive, right? Not inclusive, but exclusive. But anyway, it's because it's 391 and two days if you go from like midnight to midnight or noon to noon or think maybe it's i can't remember anyway that i had exclusive there yeah i think you could do that it's 392 days if you count from midnight to midnight so if i if you count from the end of december 25th to the beginning of january 20th 391 if i count from noon december 25th It'll be 391 and a half to the beginning midnight of January 20th, 2025. You know, I could count sunset December 25th. You know, there's different ways to count it, but we have that symbol of 391 or 391.5. Okay. So I think, um, like tomorrow, I, I just want to move on through Daniel chapter 11. Obviously, we'll refer back to some of these things. But we, we needed to tie up some of these loose ends. So, and if anybody has comments about this, you know, you can write them on the YouTube video. Um, Armageddon 66 might have some comments about what we're doing wrong. Um, but they're welcome, right? So anybody who has any comments, you know, we want to consider everything. Um, and uh, so when we come back tomorrow, though, I, I do want to move on with Daniel chapter 11. Dealing with the Battle of Raphia and how we then would place that. How would we draw a line uh, of that and fit it into our history? Okay, so let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study, and I pray that you can bless each person looking into these things. We know, Lord, that um, there's many things we don't understand, and as we struggle through these things, uh, we pray, Lord, that you can help us to consider, in the light of your word, everything that needs to be considered. Help us not to be dismissive of others with whom we disagree, but to consider and examine of the arguments that they make and to understand them um, and to understand the truth most of all. Be with each one of us, each person searching for truth. May your angels watch over us 
may you guide and direct us and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.